What I want to do today is um, take a little bit of a walk down that journey of um, how application and software testing has sort of evolved over a period of time and look at that through the lens of where are we at with infrastructure testing and where do we need to go. So not to really bury the lead by telling you up the front, but it's not really great. There's not a lot in that space. Um, but I think that part of what I want to start the conversation with today is how can we use the past to look at the future and how can we then start to actually take some of those patterns and, and reuse them and look at what contexts have changed to enable us to be able to deliver that. I was really lucky. I was one of the first, I was probably, I think I was the first year that actually got to learn Java. So there's a big shift in the, uh, in the university at that time. Um, they took the, I think it was a Didal and Didal C++ book and they like transcoded it to Java and then they shipped it all to us. So it didn't really work because not all of it matched. And, um, and more importantly, our lecturers who had been experienced in teaching C++ for a long period of time were about three pages ahead of us in the book. Um, so often what would end up happening was um, me and the, and the tutors that we were running in some of our labs would, um, who were like the senior, you know, the, the fourth year, year students, would run into a weird problem that we couldn't answer and we'd actually have to dig into it and work through. And it was great fun. It was all this exploratory new stuff. But nowhere in that book anywhere, and I don't have it, so if you've got it, don't call me on it, but I would guess nowhere in that book did it talk about testing. And no way did it talk about automation testing. So this is only 20 years ago. Some people have been in the industry twice as long as that, and we weren't talking about testing. But what about the real world, right? So I did my four years here, and I jumped out into the real world, of course. They're motivated by money and they're motivated by things of getting stuff done and they'd be reducing waste. They would have been thinking about this in 2000. Not really. I'll say it, I was a VB6 developer. That was where I started. The first company gave me a gig to write, what were we writing? I can't remember what we were building. A POS, was that 2000? It was GST. We might have been building like a GST compliant point of sale system or something at that point in time. Like really important stuff. Um, involves money and things having to reconcile and you know balances and all that stuff. Were there any tests? Hell no. Um, but one of my awesome t traits is I'm slack. Um, I hate doing the same thing twice. In fact, I spent um, like two hours one afternoon trying to work out how to get through the redo buffer of like my IDE to go back and get the five minutes worth of code that I wrote that I lost because I just didn't want to write it again and it was five lines. So ba even back there in 2000, um, I was looking at how I could be slack. How can I um, do things with this computer that I've got in front of me to make my job easier? Um, and so we found some cool stuff that in VB, all of the little controls export Windows handles and you can write some stuff to wiggle your way through underneath and actually start to orchestrate it. And in fact, there were a few rudimentary like macro recording tools that you could run and click a button and tab into a field and type some values into it. And it was awesome because it could help me repeatedly fill out all of my forms. It could get me to a certain point in the application to make my life a lot easier to, to actually you know, do the last part. But it's really flaky, right? I go in and I like rename that control from Flexbox 1 to Control Login and all of my automation breaks. But it wasn't even testing. It was just the automation to get me to the point where I was then able to actually type the values in and go and check and go somewhere else and actually find out where it was. And it wasn't short term repeatable and by no way was there any level of repeatable CI involved. I don't even think we were probably, we were probably using some version of source control, but it may very well have been copy it to the network drive over there. So there must be a better way. Like, we got this is so where are we now? We're probably mid 2000 and something or other. I don't really know. A while ago still. And I moved on from those gigs and I got back to my first love Java, um, working for another accounting company, um, weirdly, um, building a, an online accounting product. And we were trying to do all the cool things. Now this is still remember, this is like two people, like so we being me and the other guy that were working on this thing. Um, we were, we were trying to do the right stuff. So we were trying to build like an SOA. So we had a really nice abstracted API that was separate from the database. And it was all separate from the interface that was rendered in Wicket. If anyone was a Wicket fan, yeah, lots of Wicket, go Wicket. Um, 
And so I started to you know, find things like JUnit that I could use that would let me write tests and actually exercise the application and go all the way through to the database and write stuff to the database and then come all the way back from the database and I could write some assertions and I could actually start to write some tests. And what we ended up having to do was write lots and lots and lots of all this boilerplate around the outside of resetting the database and putting interceptors into Hibernate to um, start a transaction and have the whole thing run and then roll the transaction back at the end because it was going to mutate the data for the next test. All of this crappy isolation stuff because we were integrating all the way from the application tier right down to the database and back. Because at that point in time, well, it, it probably existed, but I didn't know anything about mocking and Mockito and JMock and all these other cool tools that we talk about on this slide. So this is my next step. I moved out of there and into Open Universities Australia, where I met two awesome people, a guy called Johnny, who's not the guy that I presented with earlier, and a guy called Bernie, who isn't here either. And they were both working at this same problem from two different directions. Johnny was the JUnit guy who taught me what mocks were and to start writing my unit tests using like a really nicely given when then structure. You know? like actually writing unit tests in that framework where we were using the behavioral aspects of setting the data up or setting the mocks up in a certain way, performing the action that we're expecting to see and then asserting that we get the values out. It was bloody amazing because on the other side of the floor, the guy called Bernie was using Cucumber to write nearly exactly the same tests, but from a full functional behavioral perspective through the application. But if you've been playing with BDD seven, eight years ago, you'll know what you end up with is you end up with these monolithic cases that if they were eight point font, they would probably fill the whole wall of first I go into the home page, then I log into this, then I do this, then I do this, then I do this, then I do this, then I, and then I, and then I press the checkout button and then I make money. So we've evolved over time as, you know, as a capability. We've gone from the rudimentary where there was like absolutely no testing at all through to the point where we've got so advanced tools, well, they're not really that advanced, but very advanced tools that basically let us tie ourselves up in knots. So why do we do this? What motivates us to actually write the automated tests? Like I'm sure there's a whole generation of current developers that do it because we're supposed to. But do we tap back into what the actual true motivation behind this is? So there's the confidence of the now. So the thing I just wrote will work. Yeah, that's really cool. But I think the real power in having a good test framework and a good set of test coverage is it's the, it's the success of the future. Everybody knows if you walk into uh, an application, so we do a lot of work working with lots of different companies, you walk into a lot of places and if there's no test framework on their toolkit, like what confidence have you got that you can make any change? What confidence does anyone know, have that actually what's there is what should work? The, the, the key value for the automation testing is it helps us ensure that we know that the system did work and continues to work in the way we expect it to going forward, no matter what other stresses and strains and pushes that we put on that. So what do we test though? Any idea where it's a cake? <coughs> for layers? Yeah. Right, so all of our systems are made up of discrete layers. And back when I was writing my first set of JUnit tests, what I didn't realize is that I was testing through about five layers. I was testing that my code rendered the right value and passed that value to Hibernate and it generated the right SQL and it went into the database and the database committed the transaction in the right way and then the group by statement came back and correlated the data back up, blah, 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 blah. And we need why it's really slow. So what we've learned is we need to be starting to test around those concerns, around the borders, identifying what an actual unit of compute needs to be, understanding what the contracts between those components are, and testing as strongly as we can to that boundary. That doesn't mean we don't do integration testing. But if we look at the test pyramid and we start to think about the stuff at the bottom, like the food pyramid that we should eat more of, we want lots of really fast running small tests. And the tests at the top, those really expensive 600 line BDD tests running Cucumber that take six hours to run, we don't want many of them at all. That doesn't mean we don't have any, it just means we want to try and balance those. So we need to be thinking continually about how, what is the value that I'm attempting to get from this and how do I most sufficiently test it without having a, you know, a big impact on time and manageability and maintainability. 
So this is all great. We're talking about application testing. Yeah, that's what we came to talk for. Oh, you heard an infra infrastructure testing headline, and I've been waffling on for however long that's been, 10, 15 minutes, about a completely separate topic. Well, the sad part, as I said at the top, was we don't have a lot. I won't say there's none, but I don't think we've got a lot. And there are a few contributing factors as to why there's not a lot at the moment. The first of all is it's been really hard to do. Like back when I was first doing this stuff, I was talking to Dell and I was spending tens of thousands of dollars buying hardware and sticking them in a room and making them work and then backing away and hoping that they just stayed to work. I was never going to change them or mutate them, probably never patch them or upgrade them. Um, so why would I need to test them? And even if we did in a, in a clustered environment, I know there were some places that I've done some work where they had a set of on-prem hardware because there'd been so many people in mutating them, the tests would always fail anyway because this server was different to that server, was different to that server, was different to that server. And we weren't willing to fix them because it works. Don't change it, maybe it'll break. The last time we changed it, it broke. So there's been no value in the test. They haven't helped us. They haven't actually made our job any easier. In fact, they would probably just create work for people. And the other piece is that probably the people that we've been doing that work hadn't been trained in some of those skills. They hadn't been thinking about it from a software engineering angle. They'd been thinking about it from a make it work angle. So things weren't set up in a way to be decomposed and isolated and testable. We just had these big monolithic boxes in the corner. So what if? And this is really the whole point of what brings me here, this rant that I've had with many people. What if infrastructure testing is following the same path that application testing was? What if we're at a point somewhere back on that 22-year timeline that I came along in, from an infrastructure testing perspective? What can we look at? What can we recognise and what can we move forward on? Just because I have to because I'm a big Wardley fan at the moment. If anyone doesn't know who Simon Wardley is, go and look him up. Awesome stuff, Wardley mapping around strategy, cool stuff. Lots of things to take away, but the key thing that, that he talks about is the fact that all systems move towards uh, commodity. Be that electricity, be that phones, be that software testing. It starts off down here in the Genesis space. This might even have a point or anything, but anyway where it's different and confusing. Everybody's doing it in their own way. It starts to move into more, a little bit more rep reproducibility where it becomes custom built. So it's, but it's leading edge, right? It's this bleeding edge stuff. It's only what the innovators, it's only what REA are doing. When we move up into product, people start to be disappointed when you're not doing it. So I'd hope that we're like about that point from application testing now. If you go somewhere and they're not thinking about writing unit tests from day one, be disappointed. It's table stakes now. And eventually, it's expected, which hopefully some of this is as well. So we look at this from an application testing perspective, we're up here. We're in a pretty good spot. Unit test frameworks across a whole range of tools are super mature. I picked up like all of the, Java, the JavaScript testing frameworks the other week, and they're awesome. They just work out of the box. There's none of this, like, pulling a value out of something and sticking it into there and making this work and wiring it together like it used to be. But still, the practices aren't. So it would be great to say everybody is always writing automated unit tests, but they're not. In fact, my boxes probably should stretch back a bit further. They're probably more down here in the custom-built space for a good proportion of places. But it radi differs radically to where we are for infrastructure testing. You have to have the application to test the infrastructure. How do you test the infrastructure without the application? Maybe we can, right? So I think that's the piece, right? We're evolving. As we're evolving along this, this line, we're going from where we had to build this entire thing as a monolith and make the entire thing work and put it in front of a human being and make them click from start to finish through to validate it, right down to I can now run 450 three millisecond unit tests on my application and have a high level of confidence that all of the key functions work. That didn't happen overnight. It happened at a period of time as we moved from one extreme to the other. It changed by the evolution of the tools that we put in place. And we actually had to face, we had to change the, the frameworks that we built the tools with to be testable. So there's a tool I want to demo today, which is a thing called Inspec, which I think is, has started to shift this bottom box a little bit further to the right. 
it started to make it a little bit easier to test the infrastructure on its own. So what should we be testing? When I say infrastructure, this is what I mean. I don't only mean the servers, although that's what I want to try and demo today. But we're writing CloudFormation templates. We're writing Terraform templates. We're writing CID, CICD pipelines. Have you seen some of the pipelines we're building? These things are complicated. They encode a large amount of our business's workflow into them. How are we testing that? How are we making sure that when we move from one version of a tool to another version of a tool, the thing is going to still work? I don't think we are. We have make files and a whole lot of automation utilities. Talking about using Bash as an automation tool, like a scripting tool. No, go to Python. Use Python. It's much higher level language. It's got all the better functions. And we can, there's already an established set of test frameworks around it. You're going to tell me there are test frameworks for Bash as well. That's OK. <laughs> I know. And we've got server provisioning scripts, and we've got server configuration scripts. But this is the mantra we should follow, right? If it's code, we should be testing it. I should say it like Ali. If it's God, we should test it. Yeah, that would be good. It's my predator reference. There you go. Um, have I got no more? OK, so just to reiterate this point that's really important. Uh, I don't have all the answers. There are no silver bullets. Um, not all the tools have actually been built yet. But I think that's our opportunity. We get to jump in and build them. And there are a few out there, and there are a lot out there, and there's probably a whole lot of people that will come back and tell me a whole lot of stuff that I haven't seen. So please do. If you've got a whole lot of awesome test tools for infrastructure space, let me know, because that will save my life from building it. I don't want to reinvent the wheel.